The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in the podcast belong solely to the hosts and not the hosts' past, present, or future employers. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. It is Brian and Miss Berlin for Breaking Down Security. Hey, hey, how's it going? It's not too bad. Uh, we're here on a, on a lovely Friday and uh, recording. Uh, so for those of you who listen to us regularly, you know that we're not prone to do sponsored podcasts. Uh, we, do, uh, we did a couple last year with Illumio uh, on Zero Trust. Uh, and we've been approached by another company, um, company you may never have heard of. It's it's pretty much a shadow startup. We've I don't think we've ever mentioned it on the show before. Uh, nope. Name of Blumera. And uh, Miss Berlin, do you know anything about this company? Um, just that they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, I I was not aware uh, of that that. that how you, how do you lie. not? How have you not heard of them? I just don't oh, know. Like, yeah, they're just yeah, yeah. Well, all over um, TikTok. It's uh, all the TikToks. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Ticking to the talking. So. Uh, <laughs> So, so for those of you who are not in on the joke and are new to the show, uh, Ms. Berlin does work for Blue Mira and uh, we've uh, uh, have, you know, been reached out to by her company, not her specifically to, uh, to maybe do some sponsored shows. So uh, we are going to do a series of three shows like we did with Illumio uh, on various facets of uh, Blue Mira and, and talking about some of their product offerings. And uh, this week, so um, so if you um, you know, if you've heard our Illumio ones, we you know we tend to ask real questions and not it's like oh, what is it like to be awesome at your company and whatever. Uh, we try to keep it very much like we do our normal podcast, where it's more of an interview format. Uh, we do we will ask some somewhat tough questions uh, uh, from our from our guests this week. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll have some contact information at the end on how you can get a hold of, of these folks. So um, I'd like to welcome Patrick Garrity uh, to the show. Patrick is the VP of Operations. He's had uh, years of experience in the security industry, building and scaling usable security products. Uh, he currently leads Blue Mira's product sales and marketing teams. And prior to joining Blue Mira, led the sales engineering, product marketing, and international expansion for Duo Security. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at this is not tap. So welcome, Patrick, to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's exciting to uh, be on the show and talk about some of the things that people can consider uh, from a SaaS, SaaS software and uh, security perspective. So thanks so much. Very it's exciting. Cool. All right. So uh, Miss Berlin and I will be grilling you. Uh, she'll be doing it much nicer because obviously she works for you. Oh, nope. but, uh, no, she's got to get, no, she's got to no, get this, this, like, Yeah, these uh, are all the, and these I, are all the, I love, I love to be challenged. So these are all the I'm questions the I challenge. can't answer during our company meeting or I can't oh, ask you during the company. Hat. Right. Yeah. You like take I can come at it from, off. and there's like, I don't think any, like, I don't think I can get trouble. Maybe I can. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. See, you're in a safe, you're in the safe Just zone, safe in the safe place? tree. Okay. You're in the safe right. tree here with, uh, you know, under the shield of Breaksec anyway. But, I probably should take um, off my Blue Mira shirt. Right. Oh, crap. <laughs> all right. Well, you, you broke the, you broke the sanctity. Dang it. Yeah, oh, damn it. All right. All right. So um, tell me, so Patrick, tell us what uh, was the impetus for creating uh, Blue Mira. Why? Why uh, is it is it out there, and and how are you different from, uh, say, your competitors, or every other? Yeah, that, yeah Amanda, Amanda needs that. <laughs> um, uh, I think this is great. I mean, for, first off, you know, the the reality is is doing detection and response and security operations. Everyone knows is not easy, and historically, there's been uh, a lot of complicated products in the space. And actually, one of the things that that when I actually was considering coming to Blue Mirror very, very early on, people were, were like, why would you want to go work for a company that plays in the security operations and SIM space? Like all the products suck was generally the feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's actually like the same thing people said about two factor, like eight years ago before I joined duo. Um, and so that, that actually is an indicator that it's like, it's actually a real problem and it's not accessible to most organizations because of the complexity. And that's why we see so many small to medium sized businesses just getting owned mm. uh, nonstop is the reality is, is they can't afford nor do they have the skills to actually detect when something's wrong. Right. 
Right. Um, and so that's really the focus around Blue Mira is like, hey, someone in the, with basic IT skills needs to be able to do the security person's job that they can't afford or they don't have, right? And how do you actually scale detection response to, to uh, organizations of any size? You know, democratizing security essentially is, uh, is one of the biggest opportunities we're tackling right now. Right. Yeah, I mean, because okay. if you think if you think about, I mean, you mentioned how you know that's how people saw two-factor authentication way back when before do. Like, what was the only thing that people used? Just RSA tokens, right? I remember, yeah. I remember managing an RSA server and trying to delve out, you know, a couple thousand tokens to doctors, and boy, was that a gigantic pain. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So, so you are you are a startup. Uh, you have successfully uh, captured a, ra- a Series A funding round. Uh, what was your selling point to the VC folks when you you told them that? Were you telling them, oh, we're uh, I don't know, we're the Splunk killer, or we're you know we're we're you know doing all the silver bullets and the low hanging fruits? What was what was your what was your sales pitch to those those groups to to have them give you that money? Because I mean, it's no mean feat to get. A series. Well, it may be actually. I've never been a VC, uh, you know, angel. So you know, you show me some pretty graphs, and I'm going to throw money at you. Or what was the selling point there for for getting that round of funding? Oh, I think I think a combination. I, it wasn't completely my my job. Like that was a team effort, uh, just to mm-hmm. emphasize. But um, cool. yeah, I, th- I think the aspect of the ability uh, of what we bring to market and providing accessibility to an underserved market, but also when you do that, you can scale up into enterprise over time um, and taking a much different approach and then, you know, proven success behind being able to consistently grow, grow revenue uh, and grow market. And so, yeah, you know, from a, from a investor perspective, we have a lot of great investors, both angels as well as um, uh, uh, venture capital, like their, their interest is, is like, there, we are extremely disruptive to a market that's incredibly fragmented, and and frankly, a lot of organizations don't don't have accessible products, tools, or services today uh, that they can afford. Uh, so it's a it's a really really big market as well, um, uh, from a from a growth perspective. Right. What right. What do you think? Um, and I I know what my answer would be, but you might have a different answer. Uh, what do you think would be one of the bigger things that this kind of software as a service uh, addresses for not necessarily SMBs, but people with like semi to mid maturity security programs, right? Like, oh, that, yeah, that's a good question. Cause I hear the same thing over and over again, which is like the product tool sets they're layering on, the complexity of them requires very deep skill sets like yourselves right and the challenge with that is like there's very few people from a market perspective and the price of them has increased exponentially and so i do think that like we find a lot of organizations where they implement an elk stack or a splunk stack and they do it well but the resource that initially did it ends up going to to another company like amazon um, <laughs> and then, and then someone else inherits that and knows nothing about Elk Stack and Splunk, right? And so, there, what happens is, is then that that deployment kind of collects logs, but there's too much noise and too much information, and it's not tweaked t- tweaked and tuned properly, and you don't get good rich information. And then a security incident ends up happening, right? And so, I think the the aspect is is like by being a SaaS service and the, those components being managed by Bloomira automatically and via our detection engineering teams, um, which Amanda is a part of, it actually allows them to get high fidelity threats that, that anyone with basic skills can go and, and be like, oh, this is a problem. Oh, and maybe I need some help, um, which is a pretty, pretty big deal out there today because uh, you know the, the turnover in the security industry is extremely high. So I think there's a huge opportunity in the, in the larger companies with the, the product that we have uh, as we continue can continue to grow and mature. Very nice. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> maybe, okay. So you, you, you're mentioning a lot of small and, and, and medium sized businesses because there's, there's a price point there. Um, let's say I'm, 
I have been a shop that's using, you know, one of the large SIM creation, you know, this, this catalogs and logging of, the, of these things, or maybe I'm already using another SaaS platform. Um, what would you, what would you tell them? You know, we have a hundred thousand users and 200,000 endpoints and whatever. We can't just rip out what we have and put yours in, uh, help, help me, you know, make this, you know, cause obviously this would be a cost saving measure potentially, or, you know, you bring additional functionality, which we'll talk about uh, later on, but what, what is, the, how easy is it just to yank out the other stuff uh, and, and put in the new stuff? I mean, are we going to have to worry about uh, what, what are some of the hurdles that, you know, companies like that have to deal with if, you know, yeah. when they bring you on versus, you know, what they used to have and how do they get yeah. over that risk and, and fear? I, I think first off, like, most of our customers are greenfield. They never had a SIM. They might not even know what a SIM is. And I think that sounds shocking, but like, okay. that's actually most of the market. Like only, only these larger customers with a higher level of sophistication or longer term compliance needs have adopted, you know, SIM historically speaking. Okay. And so I think twofold, which is like, one is the aspect of people needing, needing these capabilities, but don't know what they actually need. So a lot of times that's delivery via managed service providers, which is a big market for us. What I would say to the 100,000 person company <laughs> is like, hey, uh, we're not ready for you. Um, on, honestly, like we don't go after that size organization because that we, we do believe that there's strong value we can bring to them. Mm -hmm. But in developing products similar to Duo, if you start down market and you make it accessible to all, then you build advanced feature sets. And the things with large, large companies is they're like, well, I want customization. I want, I want the ability to do anything with it. But the reality is that actually makes them architect this giant SIM that nobody understands. And it's questionable what value they get out of it. <laughs> um, right. and, and, and we're like determined not to go down the same path of just building another Splunk or another Alien Vault or another SIM product that has all the bells and whistles, but in the end of the, at, at the end of the day, doesn't actually do anything without a lot of, a lot of care and feeding. Right. Okay. Um, and, and so I'd say that's what we do really well is like, f we were very focused on, actually building next generation technology opposed to like, hey, you already have this product and you want a new product that does the same exact thing. That logic doesn't um, doesn't translate well because you're going right. to get the same results. Um, right. And so that's, yeah, that's a, that's kind of a core to product development with like how we built in scale duo and then also how we're doing the same uh, at Blue Mira, Blue Mira as well now, uh, which okay. is really, really great. Okay. Um, so I, I would imagine there's some there's some flexibility here. Uh, uh, I, I don't know how it is with other other, other sim products, but uh, do you have a like a, a lock in or ecosystem where it's like you know our our threat feeds or whatever are completely you know proprietary to us, or do you have do you embrace open <laughs> standards? I mean, what is what does it yeah. look like if somebody was to come in and go, well, I don't want to use yours. I already have this threat intel from insert endpoint security company here. Um, how, how are you are you you know, customizable in that, or do you use open source intelligence tools or feeds? And do you allow that kind of oh, uh, expansion? Yeah. So, so today, you know, we're correlating, I think 17 or 20 different feeds that are already available. Like threat intelligence is actually incredibly accessible today, but most people don't know how to leverage and use it uh, is the reality. And so like, like I said, right, the customization piece of like, well, I want to bring my own uh, threat intelligence. Like I want to do all these things. Well, that requires you to have dedicated resources to manage and figure out how to leverage and use it. And so we actually don't do the, it, it doesn't mean we're not going to add that functionality or do those things down the road. But the first thing we assume is like anybody we're working with doesn't actually know or doesn't have the time to do those things. And so we're essentially doing that on their behalf and then building automation so you can apply these threat feeds via an automatic block list on your firewall and that's all done for you through blue mira mm. um and and so that's kind of like that's kind of the benefit and joy the disadvantage there is for your heavy sophisticated security folks that are like i want to do everything ourselves our product isn't there yet right mm. um and so normally the feedback with them is like well, but I want to do all these things on my own and I want to build all my own functionality sim wise. And it's like, well, that's great. You should go grab Splunk. <laughs> um, and we're, we're very open to, to suggesting those <laughs> things when we're not the right product. 
Mm. Um, because we're focused on servicing and democratizing as a whole. And over time, more and more customization gets built in the product. So we can, we can address those different personas as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Amanda, you want to add anything there? Yeah. I mean, I, I I think we're really lucky just because the other uh, incident detection engineer we have came from state of Michigan and he actually writes, that's called the DFIR, DFIR report. Um, and is really, really good at threat intel. So we actually incorporate some of his stuff um, and we can add threat intel feeds on the back end by request, um, but it's never anything that's like, yeah, it's not user customizable yet, which we've not really had a whole, from our current customers, uh, usually we get like detection requests um, that a lot of the times are already in our backlog. So if we get a request that's like, hey, this would be cool, I'm like, oh, that's already on our list. So we'll just bump it up in priority. Um, yeah. I yeah. think I think another big thing is like focus on persistence and like high value threats over yeah. like, let's just throw alerts over the walls because that's what ends up happening is like, hey, I have this tool and now I choose to implement these three rules. <laughs> Suddenly now it's like, well, I get every time someone's password fails, I get a notification that's useless, right? Yeah. But it just creates noise that ends up resulting in now I just ignore these systems. Uh, and so that's a big part of like the curation and detection er- engineering team is actually curating threat for the organization so they don't have to do that themselves. And I will say from a SaaS provider perspective, like when you look at the the major, you know, inc- or the major vulnerabilities this year, like, um, the Office 365 one, or I'm sorry, the Exchange one, or the Print Nightmare, the joy is our customer base has had no idea what to do, and they're like, what do I do? Well, our our detection engineering team and our security teams are already looking in and going, okay, these are the indicators of compromise. Let's just put them on our platform. And the next thing you know, every single customer now has intelligence, and we know what customers are impacted. And go as far as to like reaching out to them and being like, hey, uh, we're calling you because this is like way more important than just an, an alert, even though we sent you an alert, like right. you're going to get owned. Um, and so that's, that's you know, kind of the joy of the approach that we take is, is being able to scale that out across the masses for really an organization of any size and any skill level, um, which okay. is great. And cool. what, I, what I really like about the size and stuff that we're going for now is um, like with Print Nightmare, um, it uh we can actually reach out to the like the customers and like directly and be like hey um this config file that you're using or this gpo that you're using doesn't actually log what we need because that's 90 (laughs) percent of the problems with detection like you're not logging what you need on the endpoints that you that you have right either because of licensing or what or configuration but it's nice (laughs) to be able to reach out to them and be like hey you need this. Otherwise we're not going to be able to detect, it, detect these things. It's funny. I, so, I, I, you and I, uh, Ms. Berlin know a friend who, who has a piece of software that does configuration yeah, of endpoint do. logging. Interesting. Um, a anyway. sponsor too. Yeah, eventually, <laughs> eventually. Um, so you, you, you are a SaaS platform, which means you are in the cloud and you, you said that a lot of these companies have not reached the maturity of needing, a sim yet for log correlation or whatever. Maybe they've, you know, gotten into PCI or something and their auditors like, no, 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 you need to have something for that. Maybe they're a little leery of, you know, the, the cloud, the cloud, if you will. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you sell that in terms of, uh, I mean, we, we've talked about some opportunity costs here where you're doing pretty much a lot of the heavy lifting with regards to log analysis that maybe they don't know how to do, or they don't have the time to do. Um, you know, if I, if I'm engaging your company, I'm like, I'm worried about, you know, you taking all of my logs and not storing them correctly. Um, or, uh, you know, we, you know, have issues with, you know, data sovereignty or, or, or items like that, or, um, you know, performance type issues is our, you know, are we going to saturate our internet bandwidth? What, what, what can you tell them in terms of, of things like that, where it's like, you know, we have 150,000 endpoints and we're using a VPN full tunnel and, (laughs) you know, pushing these logs are going to drown our VPN. How do how, how can you help them feel a little better about doing so? Yeah, I think a few things, which is first off, it's like, 
you know, you don't get the cloud objection much anymore like you used to, right? Uh, eight years ago at Duo, that we were the first cloud service people considered. So, you know, most okay. of our customers are adopting some form of cloud, whether it's O365, Azure, AWS, other other services, mm-hmm. right? Um, what they want to make sure of is, you know, do you take take uh, and meet some of the common controls and standards from a security perspective and implementing best controls? I mean, the nice thing is, is like, well, we do follow compliance frameworks, but I'm not going to say that means you're secure. The other thing is, is we have like our company's background is in security. So we have mm-hmm. security folks building this as well. So, you know, not only are best practices met, there are a lot of times exceeded in a lot of ways, which compensating controls are often much more secure than actually compliance controls, right? Um, is, is one thing to th- think about there often, because it's like people ask, do you do this thing? No, we don't. We actually do this. And it's better. Um, and so I, th- I think there's, you know, misconception there, but pretty, you know, pretty, pretty simply put, people are just like, I'm okay with shipping logs for the most part. The the data bandwidth stuff isn't an issue much of anymore. I mean, bandwidth has become so available, rarely see that as an objection uh, of reason not to move forward. Maybe some very niche instances, but relatively speaking, bandwidth has become really cheap. So that's not... Um, much of an objection, um, uh, you know, from my perspective, more or less, it's them understanding how important it is to get base level detection and response capabilities in, in place Okay, um, is what you find. So like when you look at these cities and these counties and, and when I'm talking about small to medium sized business, we're talking to organizations between, I'd say like 100 to 2,500 employees. And, and in some cases, 10,000, where they, they're still identifying, hey, yeah, maybe we should do something about security. I think in the past year to two years, every organization is realizing like, oh, this isn't really an option anymore. So that's changing. But there still is a lot of, hey, I could do nothing. And, and you know, that's, that's an approach people can take. And all too often, I think over the last 10 years, that's where most of incidences and breaches end up occurring is people not implementing basic security controls. Um, And so I think not, not only like us being a SaaS service, but as a whole, a lot of times implementing SaaS for like office 365 is, is likely a much more secure option than having exchange on premise. Right. Cause like Microsoft is managing updates. They're implementing stronger security controls. They're doing all this for you. And the, and the reality is, is you take that in-house, now you have responsibility and ownership over that. And most organizations just don't have the team or resources unless they're a tech company <laughs> um, okay. or a larger organization to actually do, you know, do those things. Um, cool. and, and so that's, you know, that's where it makes a lot of sense to, to adopt more and more SaaS cloud services. And, and especially when we're talking about security, because then you can correlate and do stuff in a much faster manner with the resources that you have. Hmm. Okay. Um, so Ms. Berlin, uh, earlier you had mentioned that you can actually tell when a host or when a company does not have their systems correctly configured. How, how do you do that? How does that, how does that, what does that look like? Is there a specific fingerprint where you're like, oh yeah, they're, they're logging this or they're, they're sending us this and we know that that's, that's trash. And if it was properly logged, we wouldn't be seeing these specific event codes or something. Is there a specific way you're doing it or is it just by feel? That's just more of lack of, of something, right? Like, oh, okay. oh we're not getting event ID 4103 from these customers and we need okay. that for these detections. Um, right. Or like we, uh, we have a really customized version of NX log um, that when we talked to NXLog, they said uh, <laughs> that it was the the most comprehensive or the longest NXLog config file that they've ever seen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which I took as a compliment. Yeah, I, you know, to, to, to layer on that a little bit is like, we also take a people centric approach is like, yeah, we're a SaaS product, but we have a dedicated, you know, uh, technical account management team that actually meets with customers on a monthly basis. And we'll do an audit to say like, oh, hey, do, have you enabled Sysmon? Like that's mm-hmm. a free tool from Microsoft and it's gonna help us provide much lo- better level of detection. What vendors are doing that out there today in the SIM space? Um, or, hey, you, you're you not logging these event IDs, implement this via your GPO and now we'll get better detection. 
and it doesn't take much time like in reality that's that's a that's having a, a 15 to 30 minute conversation on a monthly basis with your customers mm -hmm. and i think that's the reality is like most of these organizations are too busy focused on um hey how do i scale scale revenue and that's solely it when in reality it's like well you take care of the customers and you make sure they're secure uh, and you t t go a little bit extra mile, it pays off so much more. And it, it, it's kind of the same, not only with customers, but then managed service providers and, and managed service providers, it scales better because now they can implement impact even more customers. So we can train them a little bit on like, well, Hey, these organizations don't have these things implemented. Let's go make sure it gets implemented. And I, I you know, it's it, frankly, when Windows is probably like the number one, as we all know, Microsoft environments, like there's just so much always going on that it, it it's going to get overlooked um, right. uh, sooner or later, uh, really the, the basics, right? So. Right, right. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that, that, that sounds awesome. Uh, what, what are the other things I wanted to discuss? We have about, uh, about 15 minutes or so left here. I uh, wanted to, uh, ask about one of the topics that is near and dear to your heart, and you were talking about limiting attack surface. Now, there's there's been a lot of, I would say, a lot of work in that space. I think the MITRE attack framework, where they're showing you different attack surfaces. Um, you know, there's also the defend, which just came up, which is people are still trying to figure out how to make that work. That isn't just a <laughs> selling tool for security companies. But um, when you, when you talk about limiting attack surface, do you just mean, well, we don't have to give everybody laptops or we don't have to give everybody email or they don't all need VPN access. What, do, what does it mean to you when you, you try to talk uh, about limiting attack surface? Yeah. I, I you know, I kind of look at it and it's like, well, first, can I be mindful of my attack surface of what it actually looks like? Uh, and, and, you know, what an attacker sees, um, you know, and so the reality is, is like over the last couple of years, we've had many different tools. You have like Shodan census, you can, you can find any information you want uh, in a second. And so mm -hmm. like, I don't even think a lot of organizations take the time to see what their organization looks like ex from external. And it's pretty simple. Like you can just go to census and type in some IP addresses or host names and, and you'll get a look. But you know, the amount of times open ports, <laughs> um, uh, like RDP, SSH, like, yeah, these things should be secure. And you take it a step further. It's like, well, how do we make sure we get as close to HTTPS secure access only, right? And then we're implementing additional controls like two-factor. Um, mm -hmm. I, would, I would consider being an attack surface control, actually, from a user perspective. And so all too often those basic fundamentals get overlooked. And so the more and more you can remove, you know, and there's, there's some great tools like, um, like Zscaler, right? Um, where now you're going through a proxy. I think Duo has the Duo Network Gateway, which is similar, but it's essentially providing access to the services that are needed opposed to logging into one thing with a username and password and having access to the whole network. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, wherever, wherever possible, right? It's, how do I reduce that attack surface? And SaaS services are actually a great way to reduce attack surface because normally it's like, well, I'm accessing via web browser and then I implement my identity controls and you're pretty much good. I mean, hmm. once you go to cloud infrastructure, it's more complicated than that because uh, then you start introducing connectivity of other things. But that that's really like where I think a lot of organizations overlook. And frankly, they're not monitoring for changes. And so like some of the things at Blue Mirror we do is like, oh, let's monitor Windows hosts to see for external connections all of a sudden via RDP or a Linux host, right? Because um, those are in good indicators that somebody's doing something they shouldn't. And sometimes more than often the case, the person's like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to have RDP on, I wasn't supposed to have RDP on the internet. Um, and I know that's a little bit of shock sometimes when we're talking to security people, um, but it's an all too common reality. Like we do free trials and I would say like probably one out of five free trials has RDP or SSH on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we all know that shouldn't be the case. Right. And so th that's what I, that's what I mean by like doing some basics and looking at attack surface. Um, Cause there's still a lot of education to be done there uh, that people just are unaware of. 
Right, right. And we've, it, we've, it, had, we've had customers uh, not, I mean, they, they like you have a third party doing your firewall management or just like not great change control or something that like won't go through security and somebody accidentally opens the port to the internet <laughs> and no one knows. The, any because, any rule? Yeah, well, because, <laughs> because it was off before, right? They did an audit, it was off, right. and now some random change happened I've, that they weren't aware of. I've seen a customer go a month plus with any, any rule inbound. Right. Uh, and it's just like, <laughs> how is that possible? Right. Um, but it, it is the reality that like, we're all human. We make misconfigurations, things get forgotten about. Um, and, and so there is a huge need to, to look at those things from a, from a consistent basis. Right. Um, and that's that, you know, that's some of what we're helping organizations do is, is identify that low hanging fruit. Um, okay when it is an issue. So you we're, we're limiting attack surface, but we're, you know, you mentioned, um, Amanda, you mentioned, you know, a third party managing your firewall. And then now, now the company is mature enough to know that they need log correlation and then they engage yet another third party. So, I mean, um, you know, there's, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I don't want to treat this as a negative, but I mean, are there two, is there such a thing as limiting the attack surface, but opening yourself up to further attack by engaging too many third parties? Should you, should you try to oh, consolidate yeah. your third parties? Not, not only just in terms of technology, but um, in, you know, in terms of, of, you know, trying to reduce things like supply chain attacks, because limiting your attack surface could open you up to supply chain attacks, which is you, you've got to find that happy medium, right? Yep. No, I mean, the more vendors you're going to bring on, the more risk you're going to introduce for sure. Uh, I do think some, doing some level of due diligence on the vendors, right? Like uh, track record, what their knowledge is from a security perspective. Are they, are they aligned with any compliance frameworks at all? <laughs> like, so there's some baseline of like, do you do anything for compliance? If the answer is no, then you should have concerns. Uh, and so you want them to at least say like, oh, we meet PCI or we meet NIST 8171 or we ha have we follow this framework and we've been audited in some way as what. Well. And that's not always going to be the case. But if you have something sensitive, you're putting in that service, you probably want to make sure that they at least have something um, uh, in regards to I, I do think it's unfortunate that like not all service SaaS services are implementing base security controls by default. And that's the other thing you gotta look out for is like, don't forget, like a lot of people are like, we gotta do this migration office 365. We're gonna like disable all the security controls so it's really easy. And they never go back and implement security. So it just gets forgotten about. And, and so that's a lot of the, the challenge when we're talking about adopting new and additional services. You can't assume that they're, even if they're compliant, you can't assume that the security controls that are available are implemented, mm -hmm. um, which is incredibly important to, to take those steps and, and take that seriously. Okay. So, yeah. so as a, in terms of security controls, if somebody was to say, you know, do you get penetration tested? You know, or, you know, what, what's your, what's your security posture yourselves? Cause you know, you, you have to practice good security to give good security. So, um, you know, what, what, what kind of, you know, what kind of controls do you have? I know you said you mentioned compliance controls, but those aren't security. What, what other things do you do? Are, do you have multi-tenancy? Uh, do you separate oh, yeah. everyone's logs out? Do you abide by GDPR rules? I mean, uh, do you have European customers where you have to worry about that? And I mean, there's other things too, like uh, CCPA where the new California privacy laws, I mean, are those, yep. are, are those are all things that you're, you're having to, to deal with and work with on a regular basis? <clears throat> um, so, some of them, yes. Right. And so I think like approach from a security perspective, first off is like, okay, what do we actually need to collect? Right. From a customer perspective. And so like, good right. thing is, is like, we're storing logs, but we're not storing customer data. Right. So logs can have some information that's useful for an attacker, but like, we're not actually storing data in our service. Right. And then the other thing right now is like, you can not actually extract the data out of the service. Right. As far as like, like, like you have to have some level of control in. And so like every everybody that accesses service is required to have multi-factor authentication, including the customers. And that's mm -hmm. not an industry standard. Like <laughs> most products, you have to implement that after the fact. And so, you know, us taking taking those controls. And then the other thing, advantage of being a cloud-first tech company. So we're, we're hosted in GCP, right? 
is like we're containerized product and containerizing and isolating these different components of the service. And so it's actually a lot easier to do security than if like we built this ourselves on, on a bunch of windows uh, infrastructure, right? Um, and so leveraging and looking at the different tools that we can use within those platforms as well from a security perspective. Um, and there's probably more than that. Amanda, I don't know if you want to comment on anything else, but like high, high level, like that is one huge competitive advantage of tech companies that a lot of people don't realize is like they're actually adopting the latest and greatest and have access to better security controls in a lot of cases. Whereas organizations that haven't aren't tech, you know, first or cloud first, don't actually have access to the best tool sets necessarily to do that. Um, so I, th I think that's a pretty, you know, pretty big thing to consider too from an advantage perspective. But yeah, we, we need to get Matt on the show if you want to talk deep on that. I know. On yeah, the, uh, I mean, our, C our CTO has his OSCP. So okay. He's, he's super smart. Um, we probably could have him on, uh, but okay. he's he was also like one of the yeah. initial founders and lead developer. Um, so he's, he's got his stuff together. They, uh, they do yeah. continuous security testing with stuff. Like I'm, I'm not a developer, so. Oh, I'm not. Sure. Yeah. I can't remember I, I what think, all that stuff's called. Yeah. I think a combination, right. Is like, well, well, if you're doing PCI, you have to do pen testing, right. In order to get certified. Right. So that's, that's why I say it's like, it's pretty good to, to get some <laughs> level of industry standard something. But um, yeah, pen testing is good, but like that only goes so far. Right. We don't, uh, have, inf we don't have infrastructure. Like, we don't well, have, and it, like it's, standard infrastructure, yeah. right? Like, I mean. Yeah, and and so I would say, like, yeah, also some as aspect of like, how do you make sure your code is secure, things of that nature. Like, good vendors are going to get either their CTO on a call or have documents that say, "Here's how we do these things." Like, we have a ton of different documents under NDA. Mm -hmm. That if someone wants to get in the details, I will tell you the other reality is, is like, you know how many people ask about security? Probably <laughs> As a, none. 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 I mean, pro probably one out of a hundred will ask for security details. Um, you know, and in <laughs> in the number one, the number one way to handle the objection, the founders are not from Duo. Keep in mind, but it's like, oh, a bunch of us are from Duo. Just trust us, and people are like, okay. Uh, and I, I don't. Oh, that's I, terrible. <laughs> um yeah I, I i don't i don't like i i don't i i think it's fair like there's a lot of credibility in that like a lot of people were at duo and built that company um but it, it is people are looking for some aspect of like how do i trust this organization this company and so a good indicator is actually like oh a bunch of people came from another reputable security company right and you're not just um, randomly yeah just like some yeah. random startup. um and so from the you know internet. The, so I, I come and, from the and, internet. And, well, and same thing, like people trust Amanda. She's had a presence in the security community. And so I, I think like that there is value in that. Mostly, you know, SMB mid-market and then established relationships. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of a lot of even building a company in the security industry is about building the trust and credibility, um, uh, which is incredibly important. Um, and then giving back from a community perspective, we do a lot of like um, uh, responses to CVEs on here's what you should do. And here's, here's how you, you know, you can take care of this for even customers that aren't artists. Right. Um, and so that, that becomes particularly important as well. Right. Okay. Um, we, we've got a few minutes here left. Um, so um, who does your log correlation? For your own company. Hey, <laughs> of course. What do you think I test the detections on? <laughs> oh, oh gotta, well, okay. Yeah, you gotta you gotta eat your own dog food. I mean, yeah. you, gotta, you gotta eat your own dog food for 100%. sure. Hundred yeah. percent. Uh what's fun though is you can do like uh, like because I don't care about like um uh in, in some cases I don't care about um alert fatigue. Right, because mm -hmm. usually the alert fatigue I'm getting is legitimately when I'm creating the detections. Right. Um, we can't really do that for customers because you don't want to push out like some detections and like freak them out for a while. Um, right. So you can't really test on that. So it's nice to be able to test on our own data. Right. So when you when you say pushing out pushing out alerts, is this an agent or an agentless type solution? Because uh, I know a lot of organizations are like, oh, yet another agent to put on a machine. So yeah. it, if it is an agent based, I apologize. But I mean, is 
how do you, how do you how do you reconcile that if they if it, it is an agent well, type system? Not so so I wouldn't consider it agent based. We we do have NX log for collecting logs on Windows host, for example, um, which yeah. is very lightweight and it basically just ships logs, right? Um, right. So most people are fine with that um, for cloud services API connection, right? So. Um, and then right now we have a sensor that goes within the customer's environment for the collection. And that's just like an Ubuntu host that then uh, like a VM, right. That then ships the logs to us over HTTPS. But um, you know, pretty soon we'll have a cloud sensor. So anything API uh, API based will be direct to our service okay. uh, without any, any sensor required. And that that's um, that's going to be available pretty soon. Uh, from a, a customer standpoint. So think of like O365, Azure, AWS, all that sort of stuff will be able to be plugged in uh, directly to the Blue Mirror service without any um, any software at all required. Okay. Uh, okay. Which is which is really, really good. So pretty, pretty minimal football. The other thing is is like Sims require an ungodly amount of storage and compute. I and I, like I just asked Matt, our CTO, I'm like, hey, I'm on a podcast right now. How much data did we ingest uh, just last month? And just raw, we uh, about 400 terabytes in a month. It's not bad. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. so the ability to quickly scale, like on the data side, ingest all that and then store and retain it um, is a huge value to customers because most of them are like, I don't have any additional storage, but I still need to retain this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it becomes a challenge of like with traditional products, now you're dealing with resource constraints. Right. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really not any fun where it's like, well, yeah, our, our VM that you spin up forwards the logs immediately to us. So like it requires like a hundred gig or 200 gigs worth of storage, maybe less than that even. And like a, a maybe two V or four V CPU and some, a little bit of Ram, mm -hmm. but um, it's been interesting. We've had scenarios where like our IOPS performance is like five to 10 X what Splunk's maximum clusters can do. Uh, and we can actually manage those streams that are huge. So when we talk about enterprise, it's like, well, because everything's being forwarded and processed in somewhere like GCP, the competitive advantage long-term in enterprise is huge. Um, uh, if you look at the model in which it was built. And so I'm, I'm pretty excited as the company matures and grows to see how we adopt in the enterprise because of the, some, some of the underlying technology that, that, you know, Matt and the engineering teams have, uh, have architected in. That's cool. Okay. I got, uh, I got one last question. Cause there was something you brought up earlier about, uh, you know, um, Office 365 uh -oh. and using cloud-based environments. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion online that uh, unless you're an E5 user, you're not going to get good logs from O365 and, and those areas. If you're an E, you know, if you're not an E5 user, how can you get good logs from, you know, Bloomera so that Bloomera can, you know, do the an analysis? Well, I think yeah, there's a few... <laughs> uh, I think there's a few things, which is like, there's actually multiple places to collect logs from. Okay. Um, and yeah, like there's definitely gonna be different verbosity as far as like the different additions. And I think this is somewhat flawed. <laughs> um, is like security shouldn't be a cost model with a SaaS vendor like this. Yep. However, yep. Microsoft's in a unique spot and so are other infrastructure platforms. Right in this. And so I think that's what's kind of the like the challenge a bit. Um, but I would say it's like, well, you should collect your O365 and your Azure AD logs to get pretty good coverage without mm -hmm. E5 um, would be, you know, first recommendation. And then it's like, well, maybe you're not using Azure AD, maybe you're using Okta or other identity, like identity is a key component there. Mm. Um, that is probably more important than the verbosity. Uh, so it just depends on your maturity and what license level level that you have. But I don't have a secret cheat code to implement. You know, we should we should make a game shark for Office 365. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my uh, god! Every everyone above a certain age knows exactly what game shark you're talking about, and everybody <laughs> under tens like I don't know what the hell that is. So oh, man. I, I may not know uh, what that is. Oh I think I'm going to link in that. That's the greatest uh, idea ever. Game shark awesome. for Office 365. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> 
Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was just wondering about that. Cause it's like, well, okay, we buy, we buy Blumera or, or, you know, any SIM model. And then, you know, they'll come back and be like, well, you have to have, you know, E5 or something like that. And then, you know, that's, that's could be hugely expensive for that, for that org, uh, depending on if they don't, you know, price that correctly. So it, it, I, I'm, I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that you're able to get actionable logs or, or, you know, use different organization, you know, organizational logs and, and system logs to be able to, to get that same visibility potentially without that. That may be another show where we can, talk about well if you don't have e5 here's what you can get uh to you know to to make up for that that uh that delinquents uh you know, yeah like, probably like, like i mean the, the more interesting things with office 365 that i don't think require e5 is like real creation um mm -hmm. like it, it depending on what size organization you are but like right. oh guess what the number one thing is exfiltrating data and forwarding the emails once someone gives access so they can do a spear phishing attack Right. right. Uh, right. So if you look for that and then also um, uh, geo impossible or if you're an organization that's only in a, uh, the U.S. or a certain country, just getting notifications when someone logs out from a, uh, outside of that area right. uh, basically, right. you know, gives you a gives you a leg on the attack. Um, right. And so th Makes those sense. are the types of things that I would I would look for specifically with O365 that, awesome. uh, you know, we've seen catch attackers pretty early on. OK. All right. Excellent. Um, so Patrick, uh, before we go, any last thoughts, anything you'd like to, you know, give out to somebody who might be on the fence of buying Blue Mirror and would, you know, push them off that, that, oh. cl that cliff in a good way. Yeah, I would, I would, you know, first off, it's like, we have free trial, try our product. Um, oh, okay. We so often, you know, people try our product and sometimes they're like, wait, why isn't anything happening? It's like, well, cause there's not a threat in your environment and we'll do some detection tests. But like mm -hmm. that's actually how detection should work is it should tell you when things are wrong. Um, right. But a, a combination of like detection testing and or uh, a lot of times, I'd say probably 50% of the time, we'll kick off some real threats and they, or, or misconfigurations. And the customer's just like, oh, my gosh, I didn't know this. And they buy the product. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of the, the scene is believing mentality. It's like give, you know, check out Blue Mira, go to bluemira.com, give our product a try. We have an awesome uh, pre-sales engineering team and, and sales team that will help. Uh, as well from an implementation perspective, but it only takes a couple hours uh, and okay. you're up and running. All right. And, uh, and apparently their senior detection engineers are, are okay. I, that's they're, all, they're, all, they're all right. All right. They're okay. <laughs> they're, yeah. We're looking for uh, more great. of them. They're great. By the way. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Blue, Blue Mary is hiring threat detection engineers. We're hiring a crap ton of things. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Um, yeah, the, you can go to bluemirror.com, I guess, slash careers or something like that. There's a careers link on the site if you're interested in uh, going and working with Miss Berlin or uh, Mr. Gary here. So uh, cool. Love All it. right. Well, awesome. It was a pleasure having you on, Patrick. And, uh, you know, thank you for, for taking the time to uh, talk to us here on Breaking Found Security. Been great. My pleasure.